Okay, so uh, welcome back, uh, everyone. Awesome to be with you here today and be able to help advance our discussions of modeling. For the duration of the class, I'll take this uh, mask off. A um, couple, uh, couple items. Uh, the first thing is I had expressed an aspiration to uh, have a take home exercise for today, which was based on the model that we built uh, last time in class. And uh, turns out that uh, I ran out of time to, to prepare that and needed a little bit more work before I could post it. And I decided that rather than rushing it out and giving you little time to complete it, I would uh, plan on posting it uh, either today or tomorrow. Uh, in anticipation of a Tuesday delivery date for it, okay? So this will be on discrete event simulation. It'll take that model that we built up together in class. I will provide you a copy of that model in case you encountered problems with it. And, um, and it will ask you to elaborate it in certain directions. So expect that to be Tuesday. Um, and uh, I hope that can help you find a little bit. I'm also working to get out assignment one um, this weekend. Um, and I'll seek to give that uh, 10 days before it's delivered for those pursuing the assignment option of this course, okay? Uh, for the undergrads. Okay, a few more things. Um, uh, some students uh, very helpfully brought my attention that there are some here in the class who don't have a laptop handy um, that could easily run any larger quality class. Um, and uh, I so appreciate that being brought to my attention. Um, and what we're planning to do is to get in place uh, some laptops from the department's mobile app. Yeah. So the department maintains a mobile app of, of laptop for deployment classes, which are not otherwise run in labs equipped with computers. And uh, we'll seek to get a couple of those computers for this class. Now, in order to do that um, with appropriate numbers, uh, I need to get some indication of, of student need. I could do that right now, but I'm aware of the fact that due to vagaries of illness or you know, someone running late or uh, other, other issues, not everyone may be here right now. So I'm gonna post an announcement um, in, uh, uh, in Moodle um, to this effect, just to remind people and uh, I'd ask you to, to send mail to the TAs to just let them know uh, how many people, you know, if, if you need a laptop delivered or if you'd like a laptop delivered with any logic installed each day, so that's provided, just let uh, the TAs know. And I'll, again, I'll post an announcement to that effect, okay? Um, that's to provide us with, uh, to just make sure everyone is covered. Um, even if you do have a laptop, but you prefer to run it on a second one, that's that's fine. Um, let's see, couple couple more things. I was heartened to see um, several students availed themselves of the Google Sheet that I posted, uh, expressing possible interest in projects that were posted. Four of them there. Um, and uh, those who are interested in possibly exploring a project um, for, for 394 should, should go back to that sheet. A link to it is on the, in the announcements area. And uh, if you're interested in possibly pursuing another project, what I'd request is that you contact the other students involved first and then set up a time with the stakeholder to talk, to learn more about the project, to find if you think it's a good fit for you. Um, I'm always glad to talk about these projects. Um, 
and uh, happy to discuss expectations. There's also quite a bit um, regarding the project expectations in the syllabus. Okay, but for those interested in going a little bit deeper for this class, it's a wonderful opportunity to the world of modeling as it is applied to real world issues. Okay, um, my role is to help provide some technical guidance for those projects and each of them as stakeholders who are at some level familiar with modeling projects, having been involved in agent-based modeling projects in the past, for example, or system dynamics modeling projects. And some of those stakeholders like Wade here are you know, expert modelers themselves. So um, anyway, always glad to discuss this. The final thing I'll highlight is um, just to remind people, I do have office hours. Uh, each class I run for this, I have office hours for an hour after that. That was disrupted so by my travel. Um, and uh, I'm returning to that um, today. On on Tuesday, I, I have to have the office hours at a different time of day just because of the vapors or some conflicts. Um, but in general, that's my planned schedule. I would hold those office hours here, except that I think there's another class. So we go to my office. Okay. Always glad to talk with students. Okay. Um, let's see. One other, one other matter. Um, so uh, everyone here is aware that I was uh, brought away for um, urgent family medical issue. Um, I'm a team and really the, the one most responsible for helping to navigate my father through his care during. Um, I'm sorry to say that the situation is not good. Um, and he's uh, to be transferred to hospitals today um, to uh, one of the US's leading hospitals, Mass General in, in Boston. And uh, I'm sort of on the edge as to whether. I have to fly there. If I do have to do so, there is a chance that I will miss Tuesday's class in person, but I will have that class remotely if that's the case. Okay. Um, that's my commitment to you, and I'll stick by it. Uh, just know that uh, I don't have firm plans yet to do that, um, but there's a, there's a high risk that the situation is playing out hour by hour. And, uh, uh, we're, we're getting consultations on it and trying to figure out what's needed, but um, uh, there is there is that distinct risk. I, I can say with certitude that I will have to be here next Thursday because a, a student, uh, a doctoral student of mine is defending on Friday. I need to be here in person. Um, my classes are foremost uh, obligations, and I I so regret. You know, any ripples or effects that this has, I will do my best to make sure you're shielded from as much as possible. But, you know, I've flown back here in large part for you folks and um, we'll continue to monitor the situation. You know, I'll, I'll again note my comments. Um, in this world, um, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to take things apart than to put them together. And traditional medicine, you know, record this soliloquy. Um, oh, it is. Okay, great. Um, so, traditional medicine um, has brought us in just remarkable level of understanding of uh, how the human body works and, and how different organ systems uh, function. Um, uh, but it's also led to specialization in certain areas of the system. So, you have you know, urologists and your cardiologists. Urologists study the urinary system, urin uh, the general ur urinary system. Cardiologists study the, the heart and, you know, and the surrounding vasculature. Um, you have folks who, who are pulmonologists or respirologists here in Canada who study the lungs. Uh, you have others who, who deal with GI system, the gastrointestinal system. Uh, others yet who you know, deal with rheumatoid uh, issues, joints, muscles, and, and you know, inflammation and arthritis and things to get involved with there, et cetera. And that's very powerful. Um, 
through much, much of human history, our way of understanding systems has been taking them apart. But as probably most of you realize as a child, it's a lot easier to take things apart than it is to put it back together. Right? Uh, we take a radio apart and then we don't know quite how to put it back together. Um, you can take a car apart and, and be in a similar, similar situation. And this proliferation of specialists has, has led to, in, in medicine, but it's emblematic of across the world in all sorts of different areas, leads to a kind of stove fighting, a kind of siloed mentality where, look, I fix things in the heart and someone else picks up the piece of cell stuff. So I'll intervene in the heart. And yeah, it may cause side effects in the kidney, but that's the nephrologist to be able to deal with that, you know, job to deal with that. Or may cause problems in the, the lung functioning, but, you know, um, uh, that's someone else's job, you know. Um, basically, I'm in my lane, you stay in yours. And unfortunately, the human body doesn't work like that. The human body is a complex system. Things that go on in the heart have a way of affecting the lungs, have a way of affecting the kidneys, have a way of affecting the GI uh, the, the, um, uh, system and a way of affecting the uh, gastrointestinal urinary, uh, the um, genital urinary system, et cetera. And, you know, it, it, it leads to a lot of situations where you squeeze here and it pops out lots of places, but it's someone else's job and often not coordinated with your own to fix that. The problem is not the occurrence of specialists uh, at all. We need that specialization, but we need generalists as well. We need people to figure out how those pieces fit together to cause the system as a whole to stick together, to work together as a system. And who understand those interconnections can manage the system more effectively as a whole instead of always intervening in one place and picking up the pieces when things go wrong elsewhere to your surprise. We need we need people who who can figure out how these complex systems, which which are have this kind of unity to them, this coupled unity, how they work as a whole and um, can help the specialists make better decisions. This is true in medicine, but it's also true in, in many areas. I mean, you, look, you've been building a house, right? You need the specialist contractor, the trades. You, you need the electricians, you need the plumbers, right? You need the people who are experts in concrete or the roofers or, or, or people who are painters or whatever. All those are needed, absolutely. But you also need, a general contractor who will manage them all, right? Who coordinates them, make sure they don't work at cross purposes, make sure they work in a coordinated fashion, make sure the decisions made by the carpenters don't get in the way of uh, the, the plumbing. Um, and as we said, the very first day of this class, when you have these systems that are coupled systems, like the human body as an example, but like our health system in general and, and you know, health of the population in general, it's not about, it's not just about the pieces. Um, there are phenomena, these emergent phenomena that surprise us, which, are, which result from the system as a whole. You can't solve traffic jams just by optimizing engine types, you know, <laughs> just by changing lug nuts on wheel or the tires. You, you need something, a, a type of understanding that integrates all that expert knowledge into a, a, a consistent whole picture that allows you to ask what if questions and allows you to, to work with the system as a whole. And all those specialists are absolutely necessary, but they're necessary in a context that, that is broader than that. And this class, ladies and gentlemen, is about giving you the tools to set that context and to capture these interactions. When you look at what goes right, where the body self regulates properly, despite the cold it stays, they stay warm. Cooling down too much, your body shivers and generates heat. It gets cold in here and the heat kicks on. 
get thirsty, slake your thirst by taking a drink. You know, salt is off and you excrete extra salt or you feel craving for salt and eat it. The body is filled with these self-regulatory mechanisms. And when we design human systems, organizational systems, health systems as an example, political systems, you know, we, we design them with these kind of regulatory feedbacks in place that, that sort of manage the system. Um, manage the system behavior, keep it within stable bounds. We saw a little bit with that with our stock and loan, but but it requires something beyond seat of the pants understanding to design that well. It requires this sort of of modeling, and when things go wrong, it's it's typically because there's that lack of understanding, right? Um, when there are the long wait times in the ER and people struggle to fix them because they're just looking within the ER to fix them instead of looking way downstream at community services or they dump money into the hospitals not realizing the problem is an imbalance between what's going on in the acute care system and what's available in the community. It's, it's not the... It's not that the hospital is underfunded because uh, that's leading to the long wait times there. It's it's actually a problem out in the community that leads the hospital to be unable to discharge people from the community because the services are not available. And you know, you'll be running around in circles if you don't understand how systems work. And this class is about learning how these systems work. Okay. Um, Amazing ones you you really grok um, the, the the basics of the system science involved, how you see it played out in just so many places and recognize opportunities for improvement for your generation to move beyond the limits of my own. Okay. Okay, so um enough of uh soliloquies, Shakespearean or lesser. Um so uh, we watched a video for this class. What was that video on, pray tell? <clears throat> yes. Uh, 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 remind me. Nicholas. Nicholas, yes. Yes. Good, good. Hybrid model. Why do we, why do we mix in that model? What three traditions for or figures there in, in those in those models? What what three traditions of system science were covered in that video? Well, guess what? The three covered in this class, and what are they? Uh, system dynamics, discrete event simulation, and agent Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time and again, right? Um, and uh, and those have different language, they have different formalisms for describing these complex systems in the world. I spoke about this from this podium during our last class. They have different abstractions, different things they represented as kind of basic building blocks and different ways of building those up into higher level abstractions. So you can build up state charts in an Asian-based model and that works. You know, different types of spatial context, you know, messages sent across these networks. And, and, and that's all kind of supported in the vocabulary of agent based modeling. And system dynamics modeling, we have accumulations and feedbacks. We build them up with stocks and flows, and then some supporting things like auxiliary variables, dynamic, also called dynamic variables and constants, et cetera. These have different languages for representing the world. But as I argued in that video, the deeper differences between these traditions are not ones of merely different building blocks, different abstractions. Deep as that is, they often are used to pursue different questions. They're used for different goals. And during the class, 
we will see some of the different goals for which these modeling traditions are placed. But both because of those different goals and because of the different languages they use to build up, we can mix and match them to go back. Um, we can secure a great benefit by combining. And I could stand here and, and uh, surely give that lecture again, but you've watched it. Because you've watched it, you'll quickly dispatch the quiz that I'll be handing out. And we can go on and explore such a model and illustrate how it demonstrates some principles of system science. So Wayne, could you help me um, deliver these uh, quizzes? With, with respect to downsides of hybrid modeling, um, one is uh, what was just mentioned that um, current packages have, um, and I'll, I'll highlight any logic having pretty good support for certain types, like doing DES, discrete event simulation with agent based, no problem, for example, whatsoever. Or, or no, I won't say no problem whatsoever, but it's it's pretty easy to, to sidestep it um, with the token, the token game, and et cetera. Um, but there are certain ones of them. So system dynamics together with agent based, you have to know your way around, know things to watch out for. And sometimes the performance is bad enough. You you need to kind of say, okay, okay, I'll do this by hand instead of doing it as a stock and flow model, for example. And it, it's a little bit awkward sometimes. So, well, it is awkward when you want to build a model that's kind of scales nicely, that that's really big. Um, um, you know, uh, the, certainly there are times where I find uh, it's very easy to dash out a model to sort of implement a model in one tradition. Um, particularly system dynamics is very amenable to quickly pulling together a model just to shape our thinking. And, uh, you know, a, a model that's used early on to kind of nimbly just shape our thinking about things. Um, you want to be careful about not burdening it with unnecessary uh, extra detail. And, and, and so you will often forego hybrid modeling to sort of sketch out a model that captures some thinking just because it would be too burdensome to, to go through the mechanisms of, of putting in place a, a bigger model. But I, I don't know if that's per se about hybrid modeling. It's more like models for theory building. You want to be nimble and move quickly with them. And, and I, I don't know if it's particularly a downside of hybrid modeling. Um, Wade would, uh, I, I, I welcome any comments Wade wants to offer on, on downsides of hybrid modeling. I think uh, the compute performance is probably the main one. I think depending on your stakeholders, it may, uh, it may add to confusion rather than clarify things That's in certain true. situations. That's true. Uh, mm. But I think those are probably the main two in, in my view. Yeah, so th that's actually a very good point, Wade. Um, yeah, I, I really like that. That sometimes we do hybrid modeling to capture economies like here, or we can do a lot less work by representing part of the population as, as a stock and flow model, part of this agent. And maybe for someone trained in modeling, this is very natural. The idea that you know this is a count of people, and at some point we turn them into they become important enough as a particular person that we turn them into a person, right? We give them a name and a place, and geographically, and a, an age, and a social networks, and all that sort of stuff. But for stakeholders, this might seem like you know alchemy. Like what what the heck is going on here? Like you know like um, so. So you have people and they're kind of liquid here and then they turn it to agency or like, how is that? It, it can be confusing. I, I agree with Wade um, that um, there can be times that it seems confusing. On the other hand, I will say that there are other times that if you combine like agent-based with discrete event for the service delivery, where they come into a service and they flow through the service, 
that is very intuitive, I think, to a lot of you know physicians. Like, okay, this person in the population comes and they go into the model, to the representation of the hospital, and they flow through the hospital. It it kind of makes sense, and they they'll kind of gloss over: is it an agent or or technically it's an entity that that is that refers to the agent, and but. You know they can gloss over that and just think of it as a person who's come for care and, and flows through it, and and that's very natural, I think. So so I agree with Wade. There are times where it stands in the way, but there are times where it's um, maybe uh, you know just as clear, um, despite the hybrid hybrid um, characterization. Yeah. Any any other questions? On this? this is good. Yes. Uh, so Clinton. So, so basically, uh, in in theory, yeah. when we're talking about like a poly. So talking about compliment. Right? Compliment. Yeah. yeah. So compliment, yeah. 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 So if if one agree, if one model depends on the other one, won't it like uh reduce the performance of, of one or the other? Um so so it, it so I think Clinton is asking you know, it's a very very good question. It has to do with something close to the lines of our research, um composing models. And I think what we're talking about there is kind of upstream downstream composition. So like one feeds into another. So maybe you have a model of uh, people in the population associated with you know risk factors for diabetes that stock can flow, and then you have you know it's some point you want them. When, maybe once they develop pre-diabetes, you capture them as a person and they start simulating it like that. Um, it, it is true that, that joining them together will be slower than either one, but that's, that's kind of goes with the territory. If you run two models, it's going to be slower than one, right? Um, um, I, I don't know that there's a particular problem there, it, it is true that like there may be times where um, uh, I mean, so you, you might have coupling where like the downstream things need to process these people coming from upstream process, right? And so there's extra work going on downstream that slows the model down. It's true. It, there's more work to be done. Yep. Um, uh, it is slower, but I, I, I don't know if it's a disadvantage per se. It kind of, you know, it's it's part of like why you build them together. So you want the the folks from upstream to to have different downstream activities associated with them, and and so you you have them flow in there. And yes, it is true that they they sort of uh, you know uh, it requires extra work to represent that, but. But on the other hand, you get a, a an end-to-end -end picture that's much greater. So, so I, yeah, I like what, what you're thinking about. I, I don't know if in practice it's a, it's a problem or in fact, maybe it's why we join these things together. So um, I'm glad to chat about that more if you're interested. But really good question about joining the model together. And indeed, um, that's, you know, in your generation, this will be one of the big, uses of models i'm convinced which is taking models you know uh, from different areas and 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 linking them up in some form like upstream downstream is just one way okay good um okay no more questions right now okay well we're gonna open a model that is um is on the course site so i would request that folks go and download from the course site here. There we are. There's a model linked to in the models discussed in class area called multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in. There it is. It's the third one here. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I should be turning on the a second. For those in the classroom, it's this one. Right? Uh, the third one models discussed. Okay. Can you go grab that? Download it. 
and open it and only logic. Okay. Now, in the interest of time, we'll move quickly, but I want to show you a hybrid model. But I want to use the hybrid model to illustrate a principle of system science that transcends modern. It's about the under, it's about systems rather than being strictly about hybrid modeling or, or about any logic or anything like that. So let's go look at this model. So I've, I've, I've taken the liberty of kind of opening it here just to acquaint ourselves with it whilst you secure it yourself, okay? So we're gonna have a population of people, homes and clinics, and the model itself has an agent, an agent representing persons. What type of tradition modeling tradition? Dynamic modeling tradition. This is the line. Yeah. Agent. Now we also have clinics. There's a population of people, but there's a population of clinics. And this is represented. In a different language, what, what is this for? Discrete event, that's exactly right. This is the discrete event. All the entities plot down here, it's, it's limited in the way that we were building ports and the lacking these healthcare workers and, and, uh, and their needed patients, and if patients wait too long, they'll balk and leave without being seen. So if you go here and you and you go down to the advanced, you'll see that if they wait for 300 minutes and they're not seen, they'll end up leaving the system. Otherwise, they'll proceed on for treatment, and treatment will be successful with a certain probability of success. Um, uh, and the probability of success will be given by a probability in the main class here, um, in the overall environment. And if it is successful, here, um, if they leave via that true, in other words, if it's a successful treatment, we'll send them a message that says to the agent that you are cured. And where would we expect that 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 message that they have been cured, that they have been freed of their malady? Where would we expect this in the state? Of I'll give you uh, a moment to orient yourself, but. The left state chart is a care seeking state chart involving movement to a clinic and seeking care. And the right is an infection state chart. Where would we expect them to clear the infection? Anyone? If you look at that state chart here, where do you think we'd expect to find kind of the logic that them to be affected by that message sent by the clinic that says you are cured? This is their possible states of infection. Where would that message affect them? Can anyone say? Yes, Tyler. Okay, that's a good idea. It turns out that their care seeking does depend on them being in, it's guarded by this transition for them to seek care only occurs if they are in this state infective and symptomatic. So this is the actual health state that indicates that they are, that they have a malady. They're infected and they're symptomatic. Anyone else? Where would that treatment message take them? Yes, uh, towards the back there, uh, in the corner. Maybe uh, it's infected. That so yes, it's this transition here. So if they receive that that somewhat blunt cured message that is sent here uh, by the clinic. Once they've gotten treated, they will then recover and they'll go back to the susceptible state. Okay, so so uh, if they get infected by another person here, um, they'll they'll get infected. They'll proceed through here, and then once they have sought care and successfully secured care by being treated in the clinic they will be cured and go back to a susceptible state. Otherwise, they'll just wait here and infect others. Mm -hmm. And they will 
only start to consider seeking care if they're in this infective and symptomatic state. Okay, so we have people, people can get infected and once infected, they um, can become symptomatic and spread it to other people. Um, so they periodically here in this state, send a message to a person around them, to a, a random connection in their network that says, Expo you're exposed. And, and having done so, that other person might get infected. But this, this person who is infected and symptomatic, if they seek care at a clinic and they go there and they arrive there and they go through the clinic process successfully and they don't leave with this transition, they can receive this message that says they're cured with a certain probability and they'll, they'll get cured by the clinic and then they'll go back to a susceptible state, okay? So this is the basic idea, an infection spread model where people's ability to recover from infection depends on them seeking care at a clinic and where the clinics load and waiting times are going to depend on how many people are seeking care there. This is the sort of model Tyler was mentioned, service population interaction. You should have seen something like this in the video, right? Okay, now let's go run a scenario that's going to serve as our point of reference here. It's this one right here called run. Okay, here you go. Okay, um, and it is the multi-clinic hybrid. And we'll run this and you could see in yellow, people have started infected. There's four people here. Now, if we scroll up, we'll see a mislabeled thing. The top one is gonna be the, the fraction of time healthcare workers in the clinic are spending treating patients. And the bottom one is gonna be the number of people um, who are infected at a given time. Okay, so these people who are yellow, who are originally exposed have turned red. Some of them are seeking care at this clinic. And if we, if we go and we look at the clinic here, we'll find that, and I'm gonna, I'm, I opened up this panel over here to the right, and I pull this down and I go to the clinic and I'll find that, okay, people are proceeding through the clinic. The healthcare workers are being used about 9% of the time and they're proceeding through. Um, and most people have proceeded this way. Only two have exhibited tra uh, treatment failures. The rest have, have gotten care. Okay, uh, gotten successful care. Okay, but infection is spreading within the population. And as time goes on, if we simulate it, here we go, we have a single clinic and the infection kind of knocks around for a while here. You can see it kind of the number of people infected, it, it varies, right? People are getting better uh, by getting treated. People are spreading it to others nearby them and time is playing out here. But suddenly something happens. What happened there? Can anyone say? So judging by that, what has happened? So remind, this is the number of people in the population that are infected. I'll tell you that the number of people in the population is 1,200, um, the total number. And this is the utilization of the clinic averaged over time. And you can see it going up and up. So what do you think happened? Anyone want to say? What happened? What? Yes. I thought I why they were in the hospital. And what's the case they leave without without being without being seen, without being treated successfully? What's the implication? Okay. And what's good what's the implication? They stay sick and what's the implication for other people? They will spread the infection. Now will lead to more people. Said, right, which will lead to more people seeking care at the clinic, which will lead to more waiting times, which will lead to even greater chance that people will leave without being seen because they're waiting even longer, etc. And there's a vicious cycle, and it takes off. You see that? It takes off, and it goes to very high levels of infection. 
distressingly high levels of infection, where virtually all the population is infected, either actively infect, you know, infective, or they've recently been infected. Now, I just added a clinic, and you'll notice that we brought it down, the number of people infected in the population to just under 1,000. It, it was something closer to 1,100 or 1,200. I'm gonna add another, add another clinic here, okay? Um, well, and uh, to do that, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pause it for a second. You'll see, okay, I've added a third clinic here. What's going on is I'm adding a clinic. What, what's happening? Each time I add a clinic, what, what, what happens here? Does it help? I've, I've added four clinics here. All right, I have, I've added so that there are four clinics. I've added three more clinics. Have we wiped out the infection? Not nearly, right? We're still at most of the population. Is, in fact, remember the population is about 1,200, but we've got something like 720 people infected, right? I'm going to add a fifth clinic here, okay? Um, it's going to take a while for it to process that. It's so busy. Are five clinics enough? Hmm? Five clinics enough? Let's add a six clinic here. Okay. Okay. Here's six clinics. Has it totally wiped out the infection? Not yet, right? Let's add a seventh clinic. What happened just there? What's that? Gone. Gone. How is it that it could be wiped out by enough clinics? Yes, uh, an infected person gets treated with an economy fashion, and the fact that they get treated cures them, but what does it also do? Prevents them from spreading, which keeps a cap on how many people totally getting infected. So we're keeping up with the infection, right? With one clinic for we keep up with it? Or two? Okay. Good. Your your um Nicholas speaks with reason. Yes, that's exactly right. I'd like you to now run this scenario that involves two clinics from the get-go. Here we go. I'm I'm running it. I, I just ran that scenario with two clinics, and I'm aware we're in the last minute or two here. So here we go. And we're going to run it. We again start with, with four people infected. And, and we're running it. What just happened? Two clinics from the start. What happened? Let's try that again. What, what happened? Anyone? Can anyone describe what happened there? I'm showing you. Few hands up. Few hands up. Good. Uh, yes. Um, name. Uh, Usman. Yes. It it did what? Yeah. Okay. Caught up with it before it could spread. Is what I heard. Okay. Um. So uh, I like what you're saying. Um. I'd like I'd like to invite you to try running this um, a little bit more and learn from it. I want you to think: Why was it that when we when the infection started with one clinic, it took off, reached very high levels, and it took something like six or seven clinics, seven clinics to bring it down to be Two wasn't nearly. Three wasn't nearly. Four wasn't nearly. Five wasn't. Nearly. But here, two clinics from the get go prevented from ever taking off. We run it a little bit more, see how frequently it can stop or not, see if it's going to And let's talk about it. Okay. Okay. I want you to think about that because what we've seen here is a emblematic of what's called path dependent. How you get the very different scenarios, outcomes, depending on what happens earlier 
you get the very different outcomes. And block in. There's an element of block in. It reaches very high levels and it's hard to fix once that is. I want you to think why is that? Why is it once it reaches hard level, high levels, it's harder to make it its thing than it is to prevent it from taking off in the first place. Why is it you need less resources up front to prevent it from taking off than you do to fix it once it has taken off? Yes. Yeah, I just think it's a to be good in us that once you do a word up to be Okay, I like what you're thinking, and let's talk about it next time, just out of respect. So I, I like that you're thinking about this. Play around with them all more and come ready to discuss it, okay? Good job. Thank you. I hope to speak with you Tuesday from this podium. If not, I will do so from Boston. Thank you.